Good morning, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Aquarium Live. My name's Luke. I'm joining you here from the Aquarium of the Pacific in Long Beach, California. Hope everyone's having a great day today, and at least so far. And we are going to be learning today about some very interesting stuff about how fish detect the world around them, how they sense the world. And we're going to, of course, be helped in this by Captain Joe, who will be joining us in a few minutes. But before we do that, I want to just show a video of something that uh, you're probably familiar with, something that fish do. We're going to be watch, watching some fish do something that is a pretty normal fish behavior. Let's check it out. What are we watching here? Now remember, throughout this program, you can text your questions to us at 562-286-1838. We'll be happy to give you a shout out on the show when we answer them. Again, any questions you've got at all, you can text to us at 562-286-1838. And also, if you uh, aren't watching live and you have any questions later on, you can email us at live at lbaop.org. Now, what are we seeing in these videos? Schooling, right? This is what we see a lot of fish do, especially, especially small fish that like to hang out, that uh, have maybe some large predators they like to defend themselves from. They like to hang out in these groups like this. And as you can see in those videos, some of these groups can be enormous. Sometimes there can be thousands or even millions of fish in a school. This one I love. It's like a it's like a cave made out of fish, isn't it? And as we watch this, do you wonder at all how they do it? I do too. And to get started on finding out the answer is as to how it is that fish are able to school, we're going to be talking in just a few moments to Captain Joe. Look at them go. Look, they've all got it all lined up. They're all going in the same direction. It seems to be working pretty well for them. So let's see what Captain Joe is up to and see if he can help us with this question. Hey, Captain. Hello, boys and girls. Captain Joe of the Ocean Rangers. Now, I'm here observing this huge group of fish behind me. And if you just watching them, have you ever wondered on how they all move together and turn at the same exact time? I always thought this as well, and I think this is a great place for us to start our exploration of senses today. Now, there are many reasons why a fish would be in a group or school. Well, not that kind of school. I'm talking about a group of fish. It's called a school. Now, so many different reasons why they would be in it. Maybe finding food, avoiding predators, even getting new boyfriends and girlfriends. But have you ever wondered why they can do this or how? That is a great question, Captain Joe. Maybe we should start our exploration there. How do they do it? Well, it just so happens that fish have the same senses as us, but they use them a little differently sometimes too. In addition to taste, smell, hearing, sight, and touch, they can also sense movement. And this is because of a special line of nerves down their side called a lateral line. Aha. Uh -huh. So that Captain Joe raised a really interesting point there. So if you look at any fish, oftentimes you can actually see this lateral line on the side of their body. And so far as I know, all fish have got it. I haven't heard of any fish that don't, though. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll get corrected on that as the program goes on. I don't know. But the lateral line is something that you can usually see. If you look really closely, you'll see like a line along the, along the kind of the top half of a fish's body, right? Kind of right above the, right above the middle. It goes, it goes all the way down from the front to the back, most of the, or at least most of the way. And that line, just as Captain Joe said, contains a bunch of nerves that allow that fish to detect movement in the water. And sometimes some kinds of movements can be detected by fish hundreds of feet away. But in the case of schooling fish, these lateral lines allow them to detect the movement of the fish around them in the school, most importantly. So the moment one member of the school starts to turn a little bit or starts to change its speed, the fish around it can sense that and they can all calibrate their movements to align with that. And that's how when you watch fish school, you'll see them changing what they're doing so rapidly. I mean, can, you'll see 10,000 fish seemingly close, close to all at once decide suddenly they're going to go turn to the left or they're going to pick up the pace. And they're doing this not just in response to what they see around them, but actually in response to what they feel in terms of the movement of the school that they're in. And they do this without a leader. They just do this intuitively, instinctively. They're constantly responding to that, to that sense they're getting of how the school around them is moving. So it's really, really incredible stuff. Now, I believe that Captain Joe has uh, something else he wants to talk to us about. So let's go, uh, let's go track him down again. 
Captain? That is amazing. And not only that, but oh. What? Wait, what? Studio, I, Captain, I what? I felt something swoosh against my arm here. I, uh, I definitely felt something. Uh huh. Whoa! Okay. There it was again. Boys and girls, I think there is something in here with me. I just don't. Ah! Wait, Captain! The cap. Did Captain Joe just get eaten by an octopus? Is that what happens? I just, according to according to my colleagues here, they listen. Everybody, I'm I'm sure that Captain Joe is totally fine. We we hardly ever have anybody eaten by an octopus here at the aquarium. Just kidding. We we never have anybody eaten by an octopus because people do not get eaten by octopuses. Octopuses have teeny tiny little beaks. I'm pretty sure Captain Joe is totally safe. Um, but just in case, um. Let's give him some time to sort out whatever his issue there was. And remember, while we're waiting to find out if Captain Joe is, is well, I guess, alive and well, you can text your questions in to us at 562-286-1838. Again, that's 562-286-1838. And also, if you are watching again after the program is over, you can still email us questions at live at lbaop.org. Now, let's see uh, if we can find out what Captain Joe was up to. Uh, I, I think, I'm, I'm, is he, are we got our signal back on him? Okay, I think we do. Let's see if we can find him. Captain? Captain? Hello? Hey, there he is. My octopus and I could play baseball together. What's he doing? We'd be a whole team all by ourselves. Uh, Did you Captain, imagine that? <laughs> That'd be so Captain, crazy. You, you, know, you, you know you're on camera, right? Uh, 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 um... What? Yeah. Help. What? What Can't kind of? Can't tentacles for much longer. What? What no kind words. of octopus is that, oh, Captain? So flexible. Yes, I can uh, tell. It doesn't seem. Well, it's a purple one. The kind that eats ocean rangers. I think octopus octopuses eat crabs and shrimp and stuff like that, not ocean what? rangers. Oh. Well, that's good news. <laughs> I'm glad we sorted that out. Maybe you should learn more about yeah, octopuses. Yeah, you're probably right. But I wonder where I could learn more information about octopuses. Well, you are sitting in front of the octopus exhibit. Huh? Oh! So I am. Maybe there's an... I bet you we can find an expert really close that can teach us all about these awesome animals. I bet you can. All right, Captain Joe, we'll hear back from you soon then. <laughs> so... I'm glad to learn that Captain Joe was, in fact, not being devoured by an octopus. I'm not even sure that octopus was real, which is, you know, we have a real octopus here at the aquarium, as I'm sure we'll see in a minute. So I don't even know. I mean, he could have at least gotten a real octopus. But, you know, it was probably busy. So let's now move on to something else, though. While we wait to find out if Captain Joe can track down an expert for us, we have our first question of the day. Genevieve is asking, how do different types of fish school? Well, as we discussed it, they all use the same basic method to school. They all use that lateral line. It's a very good question, but, and as we, we can probably bring up that video again and watch it again. And you can see there are some, you know, I guess you might say differences in the behaviors in, in terms of how fish are schooling. Some schooling fish do this really almost exclusively to make, make to kind of increase their access to, to potential mates and also to make sure that they are in a better in a better situation to avoid getting eaten by a predator. If you're one lonely fish swimming out there by yourself, then you know if a predator happens to come across you, there you're going to be the one they eat, right? But if you're part of a school of a million fish, then your odds of being the one that gets eaten are a lot smaller. Also, the different predators that are going to come along when they look at this school of all these fish that look almost identical to each other, it's going to be hard for them to track any individual one fish's movement. So every time they go to take a bite, they're going to be kind of kind of making a making a guess. Now, this isn't to say that predators aren't able to get past these defenses. Predators are almost as good at getting past the schooling defense as schooling is at avoiding them. And this is why these fish have always kind of developed for, you know, for millions of years in order to kind of compete in this way, right? The predators are getting better and better at figuring out how to eat fish that are schooling. Schooling fish are getting better and better at using those strategies to try to avoid getting eaten. So it's always this kind of what we call an arms race in nature. And you can see the lateral line on this fish right here, by the way. Here we go. This is a yellow tail. And you see that line there? That's the lateral line. And an interesting point, too. 
Some schooling fish, like sardines, will school pretty much, as I said, to make, increase their chance of, of, of being able to reproduce and also being able to avoid predators. But there's also schooling fish, like the yellowtail there behind me, that do that, that are actually major predators of fish themselves. So things like the tuna, things like the yellowtail, when they school together, they might be doing it for reproductive reasons, but they also do it a lot of the time uh, in order to better be able to control the behavior of other schools of fish. So if you're, say, for example, just one predator, right, and you chase after a school of fish, that school of fish, maybe they're faster than you. Or maybe you're not really able to control where they go and they just get out of the way whenever you come close. If, on the other hand, you're part of a group, a large group, a schooling group of predatory fish, they can try to... Con try to control the behavior of that school that they're preying upon by surrounding it and moving around it and so on, pushing it toward the surface. And you can actually see these behaviors demonstrated almost every day. If you go out in the ocean, in the ocean on a boat and look around for long enough, especially if you look for birds in the sky coming down doing dives from above, that's, that usually means that there's a school of fish that's being preyed upon by sometimes not just fish from below, but also, as I said, birds from above. You'll see sharks and sea lions and things coming in. And like I said, predators have figured out ways to get around this schooling behavior, but the schooling fish are just a little bit better, and that's why their population numbers are able to stay, are able to stay tenable. That's why they, they continue to survive. So, very, very good question, Genevieve. And now, let's see here. I think but while we're waiting for more questions and to see if Captain Joe found out more about that very, very interesting octopus, uh, which has some senses of its own that are very interesting, I might add. Let's learn a little bit about something else at the aquarium that we don't often discuss, maybe as much as we should. Because here at the aquarium, right, every animal gets day-to-day -day care by our husbandry staff. Those are the folks who do the feeding, the training, the taking care of the exhibits, and so on. But what if an animal gets sick? Well, if they do, if an animal gets an injury or gets sick, we take them to the Molina Animal Care Center, which is our veterinary facility here at the aquarium. And to learn more about it and see a little bit of an example of the kinds of things that go on there, we're going to go check in with Shara Seals, one of our veterinary technicians. Hi, boys and girls and ocean rangers. My name is Shara Seals, and I'm a veterinary technician here at the Molina Animal Care Center. This is our veterinary hospital for all of our animals here at the aquarium. We do take care of a lot of different types of animals here, from the smallest of fish to the biggest of sea lions, and then birds and reptiles too. Today I'm going to tell you a little story about one of our reptiles, Lloyd. He's a chuckwalla. His keepers noticed him acting a little differently, and so they brought him to the hospital so that we could check him out. Dr. Adams examined him, and I took x-rays of him, and this is what we found. Reptiles don't drink a lot of water, so waste doesn't pass through them like it should. Over time, inside Lloyd's bladder, this grew. It got too big, so we had to take him to surgery to remove it. Let me show you our operating room. This is where we performed Lloyd's surgery. All right, this is our operating table. For Lloyd's surgery, we put him under anesthesia with this machine right here, which means he went to sleep for a little while. And while he was sleeping, we listened to his heart and his lungs and we even monitored his temperature with this mat that's kept him warm during surgery. During Lloyd's surgery, we were able to remove this. And afterwards, we gave him stitches so that he could heal. After a couple of weeks, the keepers brought Lloyd back to the vet hospital to remove his stitches. Lloyd was an excellent patient, and now he feels much better. Thanks for joining me! All right, fascinating stuff, huh? So that animal care center is still working. Our animals need care to make sure that they're happy and healthy all the time, whether the aquarium is open or closed. and. We've actually uh, still had veterinary procedures happening here during this whole time that we've been closed for the last month or so. Now, we have some questions that have come in during the break. 
First off, we have Bryden and Carradine in, in New York City. Wow, well, nice to hear from you. Do any fish have unique senses? That is a very, very good question. And the answer is sort of. So there are more senses than the ones we talked about, actually. Uh, there's also once an additional sense that, that most fish have called the... the, the bleh, sorry, my tongue's not working this morning. That allows them to detect electricity in their environment. Sharks are famous for this, but many, many other fish have it too. The ability to detect electricity in their environment allows fish to not only detect the muscle movements of other animals that are very, very near them, but as time goes on, we increasingly think that that probably also allows animals like sharks to potentially sense the Earth's magnetic field and it might help them to navigate. There have been some really interesting studies done on this. And as far as are there any senses that are truly unique, no, but there are different ways that fish use their senses and different senses that some fish depend on more than others. So, for example, if you are a fish that is an aggressive hunting fish, right, like that yellowtail we talked about, or your vision is going to be very, very important to you, probably your sense of smell as well, and you're going to, because you're going to need to, you're going to zoom, you know, kind of rush toward and grab something right in front of your face, and there's no other senses that can really get exactly tell you exactly what's in front of you, at least at a distance, except for that sense of vision, right? So for those fish, the eyes are really important. For other fish, vision is not as important. Some fish live in total darkness and may be able to see little, if at all, little or not at all. In fact, there are a few cave fish that don't even have eyes anymore. And so in those fish, the other senses are much more important. So although there aren't necessarily any senses that are unique to different kinds of fish, there are nonetheless different senses that some fish are much better at in certain ways or in certain applications. Very, very good question. We could go on about this all day because there's, you know, fish are one of the most diverse groups of animals in the world. Now, Emmy had another question. Do schools of fish stop together to sleep? Ooh, that's a good one. So, and this is one of those ones where I think I'm going to have to give kind of a half answer because it's such a big question. So, Emmy, very good question. Fish do rest. They go into a state sometimes called torpor, which is the uh, kind of scientific word for sleep-like things that don't ex that scientists aren't exactly calling, aren't exactly comfortable calling sleep, and that's spelled T-O-R-P-O-R, -O by the way, torpor. And so a lot of fish will go into these sort of low activity states. But in schooling fish, that's not quite as common. They're always kind of moving, and so in a lot of cases those fish are getting sleep in different ways. They're not necessarily getting this, they're not necessarily sleeping like we do, but they maybe are getting those kinds of benefits that we get from sleeping, like your like their stomachs healing and stuff like that, by kind of taking a by kind of resting a little bit. And you will see schools of fish, depending on the species we're talking about. Sometimes you will see them kind of sitting very still for long periods of time or just kind of slowly moving and only gently very gently adjusting their movements. And so that's there's definitely times when they rest, but in terms of sleeping. Yeah, that's a good question. But then again, the more I think about it, there are some animals that school together, because even sharks can school. Though sometimes we call a group of sharks a shiver. It's still basically a school. If you look at our bamboo sharks here at the aquarium, they actually do rest in piles on top of each other all the time, which is, in a sense, a kind of schooling. So, again, the more fish you talk about, the more exceptions you're going to come up to. I'll come up with to this, to this, uh, this kind of rule I've tried to lay down here. There's no real particular way that all fish handle it. All the different types of species do have different ways. Some rest while staying totally still, others move all the time, but maybe slow down from time to time, and so on. It's a very complex question. Isaac had a question too. Ooh, how do octopuses squirt ink? Well, that's a good question. And I think, Isaac, we'll use that as a springboard in just a moment to talk to our octopus expert. But since I don't think she's going to answer that specific question, I'll answer it first. Octopuses squirt ink using something called, an, they have an ink sac inside their body. It's an internal organ that produces this dark fluid, and, it ha and the, the color in it comes from melanin, which is basically a pigment that is generated by all sorts of animals. We have it too. Um, but some animals, and it basically produces dark colors. And some animals can produce a lot of it in a big, in a big, in a big sack. And these animals are called octopus and squid and cuttlefish, and also some of their more distant relatives, things like uh, things like sea hares and stuff like that, also known as sea slugs. Very, very good question. Now, let's go see. Speaking of octopuses, if Captain Joe has tracked down that octopus expert that we were looking for. Hello, boys and girls. Guess what? I found an expert that works here at the aquarium. This is Angelina. I'm an aquarist here at the Aquarium of the Pacific. I take care of some of our fish and invertebrates that live in our cold water exhibits in our Northern Pacific Gallery. 
My favorite animal to take care of here at the aquarium is our giant Pacific octopus. Now, we're here talking about senses today, Angelina. Could you tell us about some of the senses that an octopus has? Octopuses are pretty amazing, Captain Joe. As you can see, she can change her color and her texture to camouflage herself while living in her exhibit. Now, not only can she do that, but she has hundreds of suction cups down her arm that she uses to grasp things like her food, as well as explore her exhibit. And she's really, really strong. Now, not only is she really, really strong, but with those suction cups, she can even taste. Now, taste. We talked about this beforehand. Do giant Pacific octopuses eat ocean rangers? Oh no, they don't eat ocean rangers. Uh, our octopus here at the aquarium likes to eat fish, shrimp, squid, clam, mussels, and especially crab. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Angelina, on teaching us about our giant Pacific octopus. She's very, very cool. We're going to go ahead and head right back to you guys at the studio. That's really interesting to learn about. And octopuses are one of my favorite animals, not just here at the aquarium, but in the world, because they have so many interesting abilities, like their ability to change color, which is also in connected to their senses, too, because they have to be able to sense the color in their environment around them. And their vision works in a kind of an interesting way, which is probably actually too complicated to explain in the next five minutes. But we have some <laughs> questions left. Uh, Hunter asked, how big do octopuses get? Very good question. And by the way, you hear I said octopuses. Anybody tells you it's octopi, don't listen to them. It's octopuses. Now, <laughs> the good question, Hunter, how big do octopuses get? Well, the giant Pacific octopus is the largest one that we know of, and the biggest one ever measured had an arm span of something like 30 feet. Now, octopuses are very stretchy, so, you know, how accurate that measurement was to how big that thing was when it was actually moving is probably kind of a, a little hard to determine. And whenever we get these largest ever measurements, oftentimes it's a fisherman or something who caught it, and sometimes they might be exaggerating, or maybe their measurement wasn't that scientific. But nonetheless... Even here at the aquarium, when our giant Pacific octopus is the largest ones we've had, when they've stretched out, they have a really, really big arm span. It definitely is at least as big as mine. And the largest ones in nature probably can get into that 20 or 30 foot range. Now, Logan and Lucas had a question too. Uh, do fish have a sense of taste like us? You bet they do. But in the water, taste and smell are very closely related. They're closely related for us too. You know how if you get your nose stuffed up, you have a, your, your sense of taste kind of changes? So those things are connected, and in the water, since their tongue's always in contact with the water, it's kind of like they're tasting and smelling everything at once all the time. And that, but that sense definitely is important to them. Um, and by the way, I want to give a shout out. I hear there's a lot of schools watching us today. So to all those classes and your teachers, thank you so much for watching. We really enjoy having you with us. And it's a lot of fun taking all these questions from your classes. Uh, let's see, we have some more too. Ileana and, and Aria asked, do fish use echolocation? Oh, that's good. I don't think so. So far as I know, there's no fish that echolocates. Not that we know of, but you know what? There are, I don't know, how many species of fish? 26,000 identified? That doesn't even seem like enough. Is it really that, that it? There must be more than that. Anyway, tens of thousands at least. So, gee, it's possible. I don't know. Maybe there's one I haven't heard of. Looks... Well, we're going to be working on that one for a second. It looks like Dana is interpreting some information. She's doing some research back there. Uh, let's see here. Uh, d so we'll get back to you, Liana and Arya. But I don't think so. But maybe, maybe there is one. Uh, Damien asked, what do octopuses eat? They eat shrimp, crabs, things like that. But honestly, they're very opportunistic. Octopuses have also been documented eating fish. And on a few occasions, even eating sharks. So octopuses, if they're big and strong enough, are pretty resourceful when it comes to getting the food that they want. And then finally, why do octopuses change color? This is another really good question about them. Octopuses change color in order to do a few different things. Most of the time, they're doing it to camouflage with their environment, either to hide from predators or, in most, of the case, most cases, because they're such an effective predator themselves, to hide from their prey so they can jump out and grab something that didn't see them because they blend in so well. But a really interesting thing about octopuses and their cousins, the cuttlefish and the squid, is that they also change color in order to show off their mood, show off their intentions, to other animals, sometimes as a warning, like the blue ring octopus, for example, flashes blue rings to warn any nearby animals, hey, I'm venomous, don't mess with me. But also, then other ones will do it when they're trying to reproduce. If they go to a mate, they'll try to show off really cool, beautiful colors to make that, to, so that potential mate will think they're maybe a better animal to mate with. So, 
there's a lot of reasons why they do it. It's a really incredible ability, and they can do it pretty much instantaneously. It's really fun to watch. Now, do we? I don't know if we have any other questions right now, so we'll move toward wrapping up our show. But have we got any luck on that echolocation question? A lot of kids use sound, but it doesn't sound like they use All right. So I don't know if you guys picked that up on the microphone or not, but but Dana, who is behind the camera operating the, operating things today, just a little research, and she can't find anything about any fish using echolocation. There are a lot of fish that use sound that make sounds. Uh, the croaker, for example, some of whom we have here at the aquarium, make these croaking noises, kind of like a frog. And they use those, I believe, as a mating call, if I'm not mistaken. But echolocation, the ability to listen for the echoes of your own sounds and then create a kind of sound picture of the environment around you with it, so far as we can find, there's no fish that do that. Which is kind of, in, kind of interesting, actually, because echolocation has, has evolved in a lot of different kinds of animals totally separately. You know, dolphins can do it, but also, like, bats can do it. So, so it's, it's interesting that no fish has ever landed on that strategy, or at least not any that we know of. Now, we're almost out of time, but I sense that, that my other colleague here, Stewie, who has been taking questions at our text chain, is writing down one more question, so we'll stick around for a few more moments. While we're waiting, we've learned a lot this morning about the senses of animals. And as we said at the beginning, they're mostly the same ones we have. Taste, touch, smell, sight, hearing. But there's also other senses that fish and other animals in the ocean use to detect their environment. Among these are the ability to sense movement around them. And also, of course, that really interesting we talked about, the ability to sense electricity and to sense magnetism, which they use potentially not only to detect movements of prey, but also potentially to detect where they are kind of in relation to, or at least what direction I should say they're moving in. Because like I said, we think that a lot of, a lot of animals in the ocean, especially sharks, can probably detect the Earth's magnetic field and may, na may use it to navigate. Now we have one final question. It looks like Kerry and again have another question. <laughs> Do fish have spit? That is a great one. I've never gotten that one before. I don't think so. They have, yeah, they generate like fluid coatings on their body. They have, if you ever touched a fish, you know, they feel slimy. That's a mucus coating that covers and protects their skin. But I don't think it would qualify as, qualify as saliva. That's a really good question. Do fish have spit? Because they're in the water, you know, they don't have to keep their mouths moist in the same way we do. That kind of happens automatically. But whether or not there's some sort of saliva that they have that might help like the digestive process start, I don't know the answer to that one. And I think we're probably going to run out of time before we can find it. That's a really good question. Uh, and finally, do octopuses eat sharks? Yes, they do. Octopuses do eat sharks, as we just mentioned. They don't do it all the time. It's not like one of the main things octopuses do, but they have been documented do it, doing it. And again, this is a really good thing to bring out because in the ocean, you know, we're often used to when we learn about animals hearing like, oh, this animal only eats plants, or this animal only eats meat, or this animal you know, only eats this kind of other animal. Predatory animals in the ocean tend to be really opportunistic, and they'll oftentimes take whatever they can get, even if it's sometimes something that wouldn't normally be able to catch themselves. So a lot of fish you know, might say, not eat, let's say, well, sharks, for example, right? Um, a great white shark isn't going to get eaten by a bunch of, by, by, by many other animals. But what if a great white shark is being eaten by some other big shark, by another great white, or by a, a killer whale, or something like that? Then there might be other animals that come in and kind of try to pick up the crumbs because they're opportunistic. Octopuses, as a predator, are also opportunistic. Most of the time, they're going to go for easy meals, things they know they can catch, crab, shrimp, and stuff like that. But if you've got a big, hungry octopus, and it's maybe had, not had a meal in a while, and a, and a small shark happens by, the octopus might go for that. And this kind of opportunistic feeding, this kind of going for, kind of assessing what, how dangerous the predator or the prey animal is and whether or not it's worth trying to eat is something that we see a lot in ocean animals. Now, we are out of time, my friends, but it has been wonderful talking to you again. I hope you'll join us again in just a little while. We have another class coming up, I think, on, what is it on? It's on, ooh, penguins. So if you want to learn about penguins, we're going to be doing our next, our next class at 10 o'clock. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. And have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye.